This is That So Second Millennium, where we explore issues at the interface between science, philosophy, and Catholic theology. I'm your host, Paul Giesting, and your co-host is Bill Schmidt. Welcome back to episode 141 of That So Second Millennium. Louis Alboran teaches theology at Holy Cross College, across the road from the University of Notre Dame. He is intensely interested in the role of religious devotions in the faith lives of ordinary people. We had an intriguing discussion about the role of Hispanics and their devotional culture in the Church of today and the years soon to come, featuring some odd coincidences and more commentary on Aldous Huxley's Brave New World than I expected. We are very pleased to bring you this conversation with Professor Louis Almeron. We're very happy to have with us Professor Louis Almeron uh, as uh, an associate professor of theology at Holy Cross College in Notre Dame, Indiana. And he has his PhD from a fine Catholic university, the University of Dayton, that yes. I visited with my uh, daughter when she was looking at colleges. Great, great place, great, great people. Yeah. It's actually with the Marianists that I learned how to appreciate a charism of a religious order anyways. And, really? Uh, which set me up nicely for when Holy Cross College was on my radar with the, the brothers of Holy Cross. Indeed. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, they're, uh, they're solid. I, I uh, went to uh, Chaminade High School on Long Island. Ah, uh, nice. Yeah, yeah. But uh, so, uh, listeners and uh, uh, Paul, uh, uh, Lewis uh, works, I'd say, tirelessly for the community and for uh, academia. I've seen him firsthand really just uh, uh, being all in for, for every aspect of community building and community life at uh, Holy Cross College. And um, I uh, definitely uh, am eager to, to talk with him more about the uh, Latino students that uh, for which for whom he's a real force of support and solidarity and and guidance, but then also just the changing face of uh, college life and what's going on in the realms of liberal arts, including both theology and science and and everything else. I guess liberal arts is not a, is not the sciences, but indeed a good liberal arts college like um, uh, Holy Cross College and Wyoming Catholic College, where, where Paul is on the faculty, they're teaching everything, and we have to still learn everything. And, uh, Louis, thank you for, for being here, being part of that uh, process of teaching everything. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, well, I'm not a spokesperson for Holy Cross College, but, ah, but, uh, right. but, but, but with that little disclaimer, at the college, we are developing a new curriculum, which takes very seriously the, the sciences in terms of our liberal arts approach. Is so that right? It may be interesting to have conversations with Dean Anthony Monta um, from Holy Cross in the future or something, someone about the curriculum. But, uh, but for sure, just the other day, we had a big meeting and a large part of it was how are we going to make sure that people understand the science is really? indeed part of our liberal arts approach? So, and I can say more about that. Actually, I will say more about that later. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, first, uh, say something about your own background and how you came up both in um, uh, family and uh, overall life and then your academic pursuits. Sure, thanks. Um, so, I was born and raised in Naperville, Illinois, so a pretty kind of privileged position to be in in the, in, the, in the suburbs of Chicago there. My mom's family was all on the south side of Chicago, and my dad's family was out in Colorado. So, so I had a good, a good spread of experiences growing up, the kind of typical suburban existence in the 1980s and 90s, but then also every weekend going into South Chicago and, and a vibrant kind of you still sense the the Catholic subculture of the middle 20th century is still vibrant and alive and well. In fact, I was just visiting the famous Our Lady of Guadalupe Parish a couple Sundays ago, uh -huh. which is a famous and historical parish, right? Robert Orsi writes about it in Thank You, St. Jude. And you can still sense that it's still a vibrant, that Catholic subculture that is supposedly, that, that is historically dissolved, is also still sort of paradoxically still still vibrant at the same time in some pockets of the of the U.S., 
So that was my experience growing up. Um, certainly was formed in, in devotional Catholicism, right? Like mm-hmm. the, the image, uh, one particular piece of devotionalism that was in our house was a ceramic face and it's no bigger than the, the palm of your hand, but a little ceramic face of Jesus with thorns and the blood dripping down his side of his face and all that. And it would just sit there in the dining room above the home altar. And I remember when my mom, my, my pops died a few years ago in 2016. And so recently my mom sold the house that I grew up in and she said, whatever you want, like make sure I know. So I doesn't get like lost in the shuffle. And I just remember thinking the one thing I know I want for sure is that, that ceramic face of Jesus. And I remember sharing this with some people and they were like, wait, what? Like <laughs> the one thing you really want is the ceramic face with the blood dripping down it. And I just thought that's the image of that I grew up with, right? Like in suburban Naperville. And so that matters because that, uh, my, my, all my grandparents came out of Mexico. My mom and dad were born here in the, in the U S in, uh, in Chicago and then in, and in Colorado but I mentioned that because that's certainly how my reality was shaped growing up. It wasn't so much in the suburban existence, but with the devotionalism of our family background. And, and, and anyone who studies devotionalism, as, as I do from the Dayton School of Thought, knows that devotions can cut through and like really open up reality for us. They can break through the mundane and show us what's really going on. So that's how I was born and raised. And so in, in hindsight, it's really no surprise that that I would end up studying theology at the University of Dayton that takes very seriously culture in a theological, sophisticated theological angle, right? And all of that informs my work. So the work I do in theology now is on faith and culture. And I'm always self-conscious about it because I sense that like almost no matter where you go, young people, old people, whatever, um, there, there's a, usually a little suspicion of like, oh, so you don't really do theology. Like some people love it, but some people think like you don't really do theology if you're not doing like, quote unquote, systematic theology or doctrine or biblical studies. Yeah. And then I have to tell them right away, like, to be sure we take a historical approach to this faith and culture question. To be sure we consider doctrine, what kind of doctrine even was assumed to set up the Catholic subculture of the middle 20th century? What kind of doctrine is at play as as people go out in the world and, and do their, their their daily work, right? There's a certain doctrine that's formed in the Catholic subculture. You know, uh, maybe not to get too far into it, but the nature-grace question, what's the relationship between nature and grace? Like, that's an Aquinas question, right? That's a Thomistic question. And that's that's in the background of the Catholic subculture. Uh, how do, why would someone even pull out a St. Jude medal and stick it on their, their elderly uh, grandparent or their child in a hospital? Yeah. Like, that's a nature grace question. And that's the world I was raised in. And then when I started to study theology, it was just a natural sort of attraction to, to those conversations, which is a long way of saying I do faith in culture. (laughs) Very good. It doesn't reach culture. If theology doesn't reach culture, what is it doing? It just exists in isolation. Well, I was just listening to a, to an audio book, which, which I'll do more and more these days with my kids around. And like when I'm mowing the lawn or doing dishes and the last name is Crouch and it's a book on culture making or something. And that doesn't sound very scholarly, sorry, but, but his, one of his moves is to say that, that just to point out the obvious is that, that Christian Christianity was always engaging culture or, or facing culture from the very first day when it faced one of the most profound, uh, deepest, powerful cultures, which is the Roman empire. Yeah. Right. And so Crouch is like from its very beginning. Uh, so he seems to be trying to dismiss this suspicion that like theology and culture is not really a deep uh, discipline or a way of thinking. And Crouch just says, look, this has been the name of the game for Christianity since, since day one. And I think that's a a message that the Latino Catholics are bringing more and more uh, back to U.S. church folks, that uh, culture has to be part and parcel of our faith and vice versa. Well, I'm forever uh, sharing with students certain consistent names like Timothy Madavina from the University of Notre Dame, right? He talks about like, is it a re-conquest of all the like kind of Latino Catholics coming across the Rio Grande 
or is it a, a renewal? And some view it politically as like, oh, this is a reconquest. Like all the, all the Latinos are here now and they're going to take over the U.S. But Manovina says, look, in the U.S., the, relig- the church is bleeding, right? It's hemorrhaging. Well, he doesn't phrase it that way, but the Pew Research uh, phrases yeah. it that way or shows it to us that way. Archbishop Barron makes a big deal about the Pew Research study from, what was it, around 2014 or so? And, and in light of that, if the church is bleeding here in the U.S., then we should be grateful that this vibrant sort of Catholic devotionalism that used to exist in the middle 20th century in the U.S., yeah. which is now dissolved, seems to be coming back and from, from the Latino Catholic presence. That's great. How do you see that expressed in the students that you work with and teach at Holy Cross? Sure. The, uh, maybe one of our most recent examples is our student, Stephanie Nunez. She's a visual arts major and a theology minor. She was in my new evangelization class. And uh, the, uh, one of the local papers did a little thing on her. Is it Today's Catholic, I think, did? Yeah. A little article. So she did a mural of Our Lady of Guadalupe for us in a, in a conference room, which is actually pretty profound the more that I think about it. But this campus that has no murals like that, Holy Cross, she said, do what you would like. And they didn't even ask, question her. She said, but I know what I'm going to do is Guadalupe. And so when you walk in through one of our main community spaces, you'll see a light on in a conference room beyond that community space. And they usually leave the light on too. And it shines over this big floor to ceiling mural of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And so the students, of course, are bringing this very public, vibrant and dynamic way and aesthetic way of expressing the faith on our campus. And and sometimes, if I may say, not to jump into the the deep end of kind of controversial subjects this this early on in the conversation, but but I do know that, I was going to say I think, but, but I know that there is a culture in, in, a, in Catholicism, there's like, there's an angle that would suggest that like doctrine and talking about doctrine is the only way to like prove your cards that you're doing theology. Mm-hmm. So you see a recurring theme of all these kind of self-conscious like points that are stuck in my head forever, because this is the, this is the argument of the day. And there's like political camp- camps that get set up in this, right? And so there's even a suspicion sometimes of like, if you start talking about culture, if you start talking about aesthetics and people will say like, no, 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 that artsy stuff, like get that out of here. We want like hard doctrine here. And please understand, like I always tell people, I'm not dismissing the importance of doctrine. It matters. Like without it, there's no point in doing any of this. But the kind of Western European strictly like, rationalism kind of point of view for talking about doctrine is, is a mistake. And it's also not part of the early church's understanding of how we communicate doctrine. Right. So aesthetics and art is another way that, and actually historically is the way that the church always kind of framed their doctrine or came to understand doctrine, came to like learn what they meant by their doctrine. And then and then deployed it across the world. So one of my favorite examples to stay with the Guadalupe theme is, is I'll always ask students just yesterday for saints and scholars. I asked the students because we were at this famous mural in South Bend, Our Lady of Guadalupe on the side of Rosales grocery or supermarket. Well, I guess you wouldn't call it a supermarket. It's just a market, right? Cause it's a local market and our Holy Cross alum, Freddie Rodriguez, he did this mural with Guadalupe in it. And I was asking the students at the end, like, hey, so you all know the story of Guadalupe, uh, even if you've never read the Nikan Mapu, which everyone should read the Nikan Mapu every Guadalupe feast day. Huh. And I said, do you know, do you know the whole story? And of course, they gave me great, good insights. They said, like, isn't he on his way? And my question was, why does he even go up the hill to meet with Guadalupe? And, and of course, I'm like, oh, we know the answer. It's because, and these are all great answers. They said, because he's going to visit his, his uncle who's dying. And someone's like, isn't he on his way to like mass or something? And, and back and forth they went. And I just, I, I stopped them and I said, no, in the Nikan, those are all correct to an extent. But in the Nikan Mapu, the story is clear to indicate. And so, by the way, for those who don't know the Nick Amapu, that this is the Aztec account of the apparition of Our Lady of Guadalupe to, to uh-huh. Juan Diego. Uh-huh. And in the Nick Amapu, what always strikes me is that 
he hears the birds singing. And so he's attracted to the beauty of the sound. And he says to himself in his indigenous culture, with a sound like that, that beautiful or aesthetics, Mm -hmm. I know that I'm about to encounter truth. So I must go and see what is going on here. And he goes up the hill. Right. So, and so that matters. It's not, and I told students yesterday, it's not unlike when Moses sees the burning bush, it's not God calling him first. God doesn't say Moses come here, right? We know the story. If, if we look at it more closely, it's that he says, there is a, there is a bush on fire that is, but it's not being consumed. Mm-hmm. I must go and see what this thing is. And so he goes and moves to it. Uh, so I'm forever trying to kind of show students that like aesthetics is not like some kind of a cute, uh, artsy, uh, kind of foo-foo like, topic of theology but it's like part of like one in one in being with well that's not the right language for that but but it is essential to to study in theology and so to answer your question our our latino and latina students on campus are helping are helping the rest of the campus see that and understand that and grow in the faith because of that that's great yeah very impressive yeah Yeah. Two things I'd like to say to that. One, one of them is a little negative. Let me put that off for a second. But this is, but this point you just brought sure. up is fascinating to me. Um, that you know your 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 account of why Juan Diego went up the hill, your account of Moses. You know, there's you know another parallel in the Old Testament. Not well, it is and it isn't. That's the whole point. Is you know, so the call of Samuel. Samuel's just there in the temple, right. for the there near the tabernacle, and he's called in the middle of the night. And he just gets a call. He just gets that call. Hey, you know, hey, Samuel. Hey, Samuel. Um, and since he doesn't have that aesthetic to guide him, he needs Eli to explicitly tell him, oh, that's the Lord. You need yeah, to listen to it. Sure. Whereas in those other stories, it's the aesthetic that's the, the pedagogue that right. leads, you, leads you to God. That's fascinating. I love that. I like your point, right? That like there is that uh, I don't know if exactly if this is, is how far you're going with it, but 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 I like it if, you, if you're going this far, like. Like, it's not just, we're not just free floating kind of individuals doing our own thing. Like, oh, I'll do this and that. We're all our own authority to your point. Right. There's, there is, there's still, I know you didn't say it this way, but, but, but we, we could, there's still yeah. an institutional structure to this thing. Right. Yeah. That, uh, there's still authorities and stuff. And, uh, my great late friend, father Vahili Alizondo, when he talks about the Guadalupe narratives, he points out as well that that Guadalupe, when she's on the mountain, she's representing her own authority. My mentor, Sandra Yoakum, elaborates on that point, And she says, and isn't it interesting that while Guadalupe tells, when La Virgen tells Juan Diego, build me this, this church, this basilica. But as Sandra Yoakum points out, she says, go to the bishop mm-hmm. and tell him to build me this basilica. She doesn't say, Juan Diego, let's do something weird and like, have you build it for me? She says there's still like an institutional norm, right? Yeah. So I, th- I think that's in your comment as well. And, but I would also add that the Dayton kind of vision would say like, and what allows Samuel to even receive the instruction is that he's busy. I don't want to make too much of this, but devotions is my thing. Yeah. He's busy lighting candles and tending to the temple, right? right? And like he's busy with incense, and yeah. and so in that in that habitual practice, he's ready to receive it. And, and those are the sort of things I try to share with students, young and young and old, is to say there have to be these bodily practices, right? So Archbishop Barron is great. Every he was part of that move to remind us, like a couple of decades ago, that we will have to have these bodily practices in order to receive the faith. And and if those devotions are gone, then then good luck trying to transmit the faith via doctrine alone, right? Yeah. If cultural practices that in, in, in are embedded in our, our daily lives, every single moment of our daily lives are gone, then 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 the argument is there's no way that the doctrine will take hold. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Yeah. So, in a world where uh, there's a, a lot of appeal uh, from the, uh, or there has to be a lot of appeal from the uh, aesthetic life and from the uh, kind of beautiful mystery of, of faith at all. Uh, where does science fit in with a liberal arts kind of college that's right. teaching uh, Latinos and, and folks from every, every culture, et cetera? Yeah, exactly. And 
this is exactly where I was hoping it would go. I was, I was just getting ready to cut in and say, not to force the subject, but there is a way of talking about it. So, yeah. so a couple of points we can lay out. The first thing would be what uh, an epistemological point, right? I'm, I'm not a philosopher yeah. and I realize that's kind of like a more of a philosophical term. I'm just a theologian, but, um, epistemologically, what we have noticed, we were just having a conversation the other day in that curriculum meeting I was, I was referring to. And one of our science professors, uh, Jen is her name. And she said, she said, it was a great kind of vulnerable question. She said, how should, like, let's have, she wanted like a particular conversation about what do we expect from the sciences to fit into our vision here of the liberal arts tradition? And it was a great direct question. Mm -hmm. And she said, even more to the point, what do you want from the human in the humanities? Someone from the humanities say like, this is what I would like to hear the science classes talk about. And I thought that was another great direct question to help us achieve this vision. So I, I jumped in and I said, I have a loaded response to this, Tien. Um, <laughs> I said, what I would love is for someone to teach the students in the sciences. And she's all about this, by the way, she reads like, um, she she's going to read like Pope Benedict's in the beginning when he was just Cardinal Ratzinger. Well, not just, but when he was Cardinal Ratzinger and she's got, she loves that sort of stuff in terms of science and theology. So to cut to the point, I said, I would love for the sciences to show our students that the scientific method, what's the origin of that? What's the history of that? It's great. But in terms of epistemology, it is not the only way to know reality, Right. And for our students to, to recognize and appreciate and understand that that is certainly great. In fact, I always tell students, I'm well aware that with prayer and the sciences, my my dad was able to stay alive with his cancer for, for eight years instead of one or two years. Right. Wow. And I'm, I'm fully aware that science played a role in that along with prayer. But I would love it if our students understood, like our Holy Cross students in a liberal arts tradition understood science is not the only epistemology science is not the only way of knowing reality that it helps, but, and and there's much good that comes from it, but there are other ways of knowing and back to the bodily practices, bodily practices and devotions and prayer cards and a rosary in your pocket. And even, even, I don't know if some students are scandalized by this or not, but even a tattoo of our lady of Guadalupe on your back or Jesus, right? Like, this is a way of knowing the world. This is a way of knowing reality as well. Yeah. So yeah. that's one of the big things that, that for sure, in terms of like, where does science fit into this? And I have other things we can say about like evolutionary biology and Peter Kreef's great work on that. And, and mm-hmm. Dr. Baglow across the street at the university of Notre Dame, but maybe we'll, we'll save that for a little later. Yeah. It sounded like you were going to jump in, Paul. Yeah. The, <laughs> there's, there's been something that's been on my mind for the majority of the, of the, uh, interview so far. And it's something that I can't, I don't, I don't know that I can possibly enunciate it without trying to sound like a devil's advocate. I really want there to be an answer to this, but this is something that, I mean, and of course, I mean, I have to have faith. I choose to have faith that this is not, you know, this really depressing analysis of uh, human culture is not uh, (laughs) the answer, but nevertheless, it's, it's under there. Um, I mean, there's a certain, you know, and this is me, distilling it but you know i don't have to do much distilling from some of the some of the things that i've read about you know the evolution of culture and birth rates Mm -hmm. and you know Mm -hmm. secularization and things like that you know the argument goes somewhat like this that you know so from northwest europe and whether you want to date it to the reformation or the enlightenment or wherever you know you get this awful you know religion gets pulled out of culture and put over on this shelf and relegated to a Mm -hmm. a second class status of, you know, something that's just personal and secularization happens and birth rates collapse and consumerism rises. And so you have, Mm -hmm. you know, France, the UK, the Nordic countries, Germany, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's just, and it's just, you know, as people get wealthy, as people do what's necessary to achieve what in the United States or Northwest Europe we call being middle class, they're just going to follow that path. And I mean, I remember reading something, I forget whether it was in Bellic or Chesterton, where they were just bragging so much on the Quebecois of the early 20th century. And that's kind of horrifying to me because, you know, I remember talking to someone in the law school in Notre Dame back when I was at Notre Dame. 
about yeah she was from she was from canada and yeah quebec was just massively massively secular and the catholic right. culture just completely right. collapsed and right. like in our just in the past decade two decades catholic culture in ireland has kind of collapsed um you know all these places that we point to and so it's just like and you know as latinos get wealthy as they enter the middle class you know right. their catholic culture will collapse too and right. eventually it will just you know there, there won't be any more of this and it's just it's just an economic you know right. it's just it's just destiny I, yeah. like i said that's that sounds terrible and i hope it's not true <laughs> well I, <laughs> I will say i like the way you framed it too as it sounds horrible i hope it's not true but but then i can also add that you just laid out the syllabus <laughs> for one of my classes All right. yeah. and uh, i take that very it's it's, it's a the course currently is called theology 240 christ church and culture it's yeah. a second required course for our, for our students for their core major the core part of their 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 ba degree and and I get to teach it this summer at this uh, in the Moreau College Initiative. It's it's a it's a it's where we grant degrees to students who are at Westfield Prison, and Notre Dame is involved, of course, in, in Holy Cross College. College. So that's that's exactly in my syllabus for theology 240, 240 Christ Church and culture. And uh, I won't even restate it because it's exactly as you laid it out there. Paul. <laughs> and so, but I am I, I do try to raise the point with the students. Then is to say that like look. When religion is sort of squeezed out and science comes to the forefront, that didn't just happen neutrally. Bill Portier likes to use in, in William Cavanaugh, some theologians like to emphasize that, like, none of this is neutral, people. None of this is like innocent. This right. is all this is all programmed from from the early days of the rise of the state, the nation state, the rise of the princes looking for power. It's not. And, and of course, as Cavanaugh points out. The reason why people receive that narrative so much, Paul, that you're talking about, they're like, this is the way it should be. We're, we're going to be more modern is because and that religion was the problem and holding us back or something. Yeah. The reason they receive that that argument so well and then dutifully fall in line with that argument or that that what that that kind of genealogy Kavanaugh says is because is because the, the princes at the time knew that they had to delegitimize religion anyways yeah. to create a space for them to take control of it. Yeah. And there's this great article. I mean, it's dated and many of my colleagues know that we, we talk about how this article is dated, but it is still essential reading yeah. um, to get to the core of an argument. And it's from William Cavanaugh. It's called uh, the wars of religion and the rise of the nation state is mm -hmm. the, is the subtitle of it. So, the wars of religion and the rise of the nation state. And he lays out that argument there, like yeah. how the early princes were, were systematically trying to get religion away so that they can step in and, and make their moves, which as you said, then it moves to uh, the economy changes. Uh, technology begins to serve that. I even end the syllabus by saying maybe one step further is, is like kind of borrowing from Christopher West uh, as popular as he is. And he's, he's not trying to do something like Kavanaugh, but, but he fits in the argument. I always end the syllabus by telling the students, you know why you should care about this argument is because it ends in your bedroom. Someday you're going to yeah. be married or you're going to be dating somebody. And, and the way you view that person will have the weight of all the secularization and modernity. Is this, is this man that I'm trying to date or this girl that I'm trying to date, uh, right? Like is who I'm going to marry or something. How do I view them? Do I view them as object? To what extent do I view them as object? To what extent is that framed by my use of technology? To what extent is that framed by the way I engage in commerce every day? To what extent is that go, does that go all the way back to the rise of the nation states and modernity? Anyways, I love, I love that you brought that up, Paul. That's exactly how I view the, the mm. state of things today. So in some sense, that places, well, I mean, of course, ultimately, you know, <laughs> If, if any good is going to happen, God is going to have to be at the start of it. So what, what, what are, what is the Holy Spirit working on that we need to cooperate with to get off mm -hmm. of this track and find a new, better way forward for, you know, yeah. the whole human race? <laughs> you know, what I think is, is, is useful is that there are sophisticated arguments like, like what you've laid out and what I've tried to lay out. Uh, and of course, you and I are not coming up with that thesis so much yeah. as like other scholars are busy working on it. What I really love and I show the students is when it's like an atheist who also sees a similar thing going on there and wants there to be a way out. Uh, and they might not be able to be, say, like Jesus is the way out. 
Mm-hmm. And like right, intellectually, they're not able to say that. But but when the atheists lay that out, I, I try to tell the students, like, look, this is someone like from outside the usual suspects, as I say. It's like, you know, if it was a priest telling you this or a theologian, mm-hmm. then 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 fine. You would think we have a loaded agenda. Mm-hmm. But but when like an atheist or someone from your own side, if you will, like yeah. is kind of pointing out this 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 need to like nuance things and, and call things into critique. I, I see that as a hopeful sign that like even in the natural state of things, people are realizing that that is not the way to go. Can, can I give you an example? Like the yeah. great Aldous Huxley in Brave New World. I we just all know the story. We all know your book on Tuesday. Wow. Yeah. Well, what you what you need to learn or uh, read or listen to is um, in Brave New World, uh, the, like one of the current release, uh, one of the current editions. He gives an essay. And I don't know which one, which version you listened to. Did I have a little essay from him? No. Uh, from years later, he looks back at it. And I, so I'll tell the students, I wish I had the copy with me. Okay. In the, in the essay, he says a couple things. One thing for sure that I think is the most interesting is he says, I wish I had given the savage a third way out. Uh-huh. And he says, this is Aldous Huxley, right? right. Who's, who's not like a committed Catholic or anything. And so my understanding, when I looked him up, uh, he seems to be atheist to the day he dies, right? He doesn't like convert or move towards Christianity, I don't think. Like the great Kurt Vonnegut kind of m- seems to be moving yeah. towards Christianity, even if he, and he speaks more gently about it towards the end of his life as, as he progresses um, but, but as a humanist, right? But, but Huxley says, I wish I had given the savage a third way out. And he says it would be religion. Wow. Right. So that you know what the end of things is, yeah. And I just I'm uh, I'm always excited when I read that. Even now, I feel sort of like you know like like kind of goosebumps thinking like Huxley sees this. Yeah, that's the way out. So I was sharing this with students the other day who are not religious, uh, yeah. and and they were really intrigued by that. Earlier uh, in the essay, he also points out I don't know if this is too weird, but but earlier in the essay, Huxley says something about like. He's, he's like, look, these, these totalitarian governments want you to be their subject, of course. But really the trick is, and this is the point of Brave New World, right? Is right. that he's like, but they don't want you to question your servitude. They want you to like it and enjoy it. And Huxley makes the move to say he links it to free sex, which of course is kind of yeah. really like on the surface of Brave New World. And he says this whole business of like, let me try to do it the way he does it. He says, as you're... As your as your slavery to the systems increases, mm-hmm. your free sex will also increase. Yeah, right. So he's trying to mess with their heads and say, like, you think that you're free because we're like, oh, yeah. I can just sleep with who I want to, and this makes me a free, autonomous individual. And Huxley says, no, it doesn't. The, the yeah. state is giving you that idea this, the, to to make you more acclimated to your servitude in every other aspect of your lives. And yeah. So so a sign of hope for me is that like to show students that like Huxley gets it maybe even the better sign of hope in my world is that when I show it to students who are like, re- who would resist this sort of preaching, if you will, mm-hmm. that they receive it, man. And they seem to say, they seem to know that Huxley's onto something and then they examine their own lives. And, and I won't name names of students who begin furiously writing notes in class. Yeah. And I kind of say like, well, you seem to be taking a lot of notes. What's going on? And <laughs> one student, I remember distinctly, he was a star of our soccer team years ago. Yeah. And there were many stars, so that doesn't give him away. Uh, yeah. But I remember he looked up and this is the guy who like, this is, this is the dude on campus. And in front of his peers, he looked up and he said, well, I am taking notes like a madman. He said, and I was like, why? And he said, I just wish someone had taught me this long ago and yeah. it would have saved me a lot of trouble. Yeah. So, so I see that as a sign of hope that people who are not really in the church see these arguments and identify the value of the arguments, the, the how spot on these arguments are. Yeah. Yeah. And this goes back to the whole idea of liberal arts around which both Holy Cross and Wyoming Catholic are uh, built. Um, that's the whole idea of liberal meaning liberating people to be right. their fullest self. Huh? And to free them. Yeah, from the yeah. trappings. Yeah. yeah, very interesting. Yeah, I mean, yeah. not to not to make this what high, brave new world completely hijack this conversation, but toward the end, <laughs> when um, you know the world controller is, I mean, it's 
It's a hilarious book. It's a complete, almost a complete failure as a novel. I mean, the setting is just so incredibly compelling. Um, but he can't. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 a it's a terrible novel about terrible people. It's like you know, like all the worst people in Graham Greene or who else might think of? Um, like just all distilled down into like you know, I don't care what happens to any of these people. I mean, I'm rooting for the meteor. I'm rooting for the nuclear war. I just I just want this whole thing to be eliminated. Um, but but at the end, the uh, the world controller is talking about. Well, you know, honestly. We pay lip service to you know science in this brave new world, but we've suppressed that too, right. because we you know we can't actually have you know a quest for truth of any kind. Right. Um, you know he he suppresses a book about biology, um, and then he you know and then as he's explaining this to these three people who are going to be exiled to you know nowhere so that they can you know not be a danger to this constructed society. Um, yeah, he's like, you know, this is, this is what's going on behind the curtain and I'm suppressing all of this because I have to, um, in order to keep this, you know, we've given up on truth so that we can have stability period. End of story. Yeah. Right. There's no more discussion. There's no true, just, well, there's no true scientific inquiry, right? Maybe to your point, there's no true dialogue. There's no true arguments anymore. Yeah. Uh, Certainly in my mind, it comes back to like, we're not really doing science then because we're not arguing about it with competing, competing research, competing claims. Yeah. Yeah. My students are some students, depending on which which audience here is at what campus I'm on, when we talk about like you do know that science is like also not neutral. This is a point that, that Terrence W. Tilly, uh, one of my one of my mentors back in the day at Dayton, kind of helped me see. And Tilly is supposedly, I mean, people would argue he's like, he's like no conservative or something, but but he, he does bring up this point and he says he says I remember the day he said science is not neutral. And, and as an undergrad or as an early on in my graduate studies, I thought like, what? what does he mean by that? And he said, it's all funded. It's all, yeah, it's oh, all yeah. funded. So, yeah. And again, like, I think that, I think that a comment like that would maybe land him in like in a certain ideological camp, either left or right. I don't know these days, but, but it's, but it's true that science is funded and whoever can do the best lobbying will, will get yeah yeah it's a get human, their human act. Yeah. yeah which again for a thousand times over this in no way should be interpreted as dr lewis l brown dismissing the sciences and the importance of it or as like aligning with a certain ideological camp uh, yeah yeah, yeah. That's, i mean that's I mean the problem that we, we want all or nothing answers and we want all or nothing solutions and that's not how the world actually right. is you know everything can be done well or poorly and almost, and pretty much all of it has some kind of value, but yeah. 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 This, this whole narrative, that you know, as science increases, as secularism, as science is, you know, you know, the modern economy increases, you know, it will will just squeeze out spirituality. It will squeeze out devotions. It will squeeze, it will squeeze out sincere religion, period. That's, that's just the narrative. Let's, let's break that narrative. I was going to say, you're great at what you do there, Paul, because you've, you've totally brought it all together. Um, one of the other big concerns that I, that I, I, I have seen in the classroom and, and Barron's attention to the Pew Research mm-hmm. Survey from a few years ago helped me to kind of really hone in on this. So the Pew Research Survey re, uh, indicates, and Barron makes a big deal about this, is that one of the main reasons young people leave the church is that they'll say something like, and there's a narrative that they, they give their narratives in the, yeah. in the survey. They'll say, when I get to, when I got to the, to college, I was like, wait a second, evolution of biology is like real. And the way that I thought about my faith must not match up. Ergo, I guess my faith is dumb. I'm done with being uh, a believer. Right. Yeah. And Baron Baron seems in some articles, he seems to be fear. It not seems to be. He's very much angry because he says, like, this is so, such an easy problem to solve. People, yeah. there are ways of talking about evolutionary biology and that the church does uh, accept it. Yeah. And that and, and but but I love. So ever since I've read Baron's kind of take on the Pew Research and his call to to all of us to do something about this, he, he says, like, wake up. Yeah. And I thought he's right. So then I started giving writing prompts about evolutionary biology and theology in light of Genesis and so on. And, yeah. and I use Peter Kreef's 
little bit and it's a really small section and his, his own little kind of, it's a famous kind of catechism of the catechism. It's got a red border and a beige mm-hmm. uh, center. Point. And usually people recognize it by the colors. They'll say like, Oh, that Peter Kreef book with the red border. And say, yep, that's the one. <laughs> so, so in there, he just flat out says very simply, cogently and so on. He says, he says, look, evolutionary biology, we can talk about it. The extent to which um, it's, but the extent to which it starts to say that like, we, we do not come from God or dismisses God, then we, we then then it's then then we're not going to follow evolutionary biology. Right. But he's saying, like, but we there is a thing called evolution, and then he says the extent to which evolutionary biology would dismiss the fact that the human person matters and has a soul given by God. Yeah, is the extent to which like we, of course we're not going to be in line with that sort of evolutionary biology. But at the end of those two simple points, he says. But the extent to which, like, we can say all these other things while well, God is with us in this world and we are, we do evolve. And while well, God is with us in this world and has given humanity a soul to set it, a, a soul that's destined for God in a different way, then we can still talk about evolution or biology. Just kind of he sets those two things as like kind of what brackets or doctrinal points that, of course, like we, we couldn't go beyond and nor would we want to. I forget the author of finding Darwin's God. I should have looked that up before this interview. Uh, Kenneth Miller, I want to say. There you go. That's a text in our senior class on evolution at Wyoming Catholic. Yeah, exactly. What I absolutely love about Kenneth Miller's move in finding Darwin's God is that he says to his fellow scientists, he's like, you can argue all you want about randomness and in creation. And he said, but, but you can't, add a value to that. Like you can't, you can't make a value claim on that and saying like, therefore it's all meaningless. As Miller says in finding Darwin's God, he's like, that's, that's not your role. That's not, you don't have the discipline. You're not in the capacity to, to argue whether or not there's meaning or no meaning behind that. Your job is just to describe what you see in creation as a scientist. Yeah. So I find all of those conversations really actually fruitful. And our students really have never thought about these things as well. That like, wait, I can talk about evolution or biology in a theological perspective and and maybe science can't make a claim to whether or not something is meaningful or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it is. It is a radically incomplete. You know, the humanity, human life is not understandable solely from that perspective. It's just not. That's obvious um, if you let yourself think about it. And yet, and yet, we find ourselves running down that rail. Those rails. That's really so. I've I've certainly given students and and Tian, who my colleague at Holy Cross College in the sciences, who I referenced earlier, she spends a large part of her syllabus in in one of her science classes having students write through those write essays on on those kind of conversations and those questions. So, so looking for rays of hope. Mm-hmm. I know I'm on the home team here, but uh, rooting right. for the home team. <laughs> Cross College is certainly doing it. They're not afraid. To have students, because you can imagine there, there might be some Catholic campuses that would say like, no, we're never going to uh, open uh, a chapter on evolution or biology. And, and mm-hmm. Holy Cross says like, do it. Well, why should we be afraid of truth? And right. kind of like Augustine, if you're pursuing truth sincerely and I'm pursuing truth sincerely, we're going to get there. Right on. Yeah. And before we run out of time. Louis, I wanted to, you mentioned in passing before uh, two programs that you're involved in, which I also see as uh, rays of hope, the Moreau program and the Saints and Scholars program. Could you just tell our listeners a, a little thing about both of those? Sure. The, uh, the Saints and Scholars program started around, I think, 2016. I remember we wrote the grant yeah, early on in 2016. Mike Griffin, who's now, who's now the provost, at Holy Cross College. Then he was the chair of theology at Holy Cross. And I was, you know, an assistant professor and, and Diane Barless as well. And then with Andrew Palanecki, former campus ministry director, and a team of other people, including our, our IT people, Doug Blair and so on, we we worked hard to, to get the, it was a Lily grant, as Lily is, as Mike Griffin says, what does he say? Lily is the patroness of, of the Catholic church today. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so they gave, they, they awarded us the grant. I think it's the same grant that ND vision came out of long ago too, the same kind of grant. Hmm. And so the idea was this, that Lily said, the Lily endowment said, 
you know, create a program that answers the questions of the day. And I love that phrasing right away. And so we thought, okay, let's create a program that addresses all of the major questions of the day. And you were supposed to use your faith tradition, as Lily said, mm-hmm. to, to, to help students respond to those questions. So we said, we'll do theology and whatever the question is. So theology and, and immigration or human rights, theology and ecology, theology and health and medicine, theology and media, because the, right, this is the track that I teach. And so media seems to be like a, a chaos sort of today. So how do students like learn to navigate media, theology and business, right? That the main idea in, in theology and leadership is, is another track that we have. But the idea was to say, if students, um, so business, like we need a better understanding of like economy or economics, we need a better understanding of how health and medicine work and on and on. And we thought we should bring theology to that, to inform a student's conversation. And, you know, it's really basic. Actually, we learned Maria Schomer, uh, she was Maria Surratt Schomer, and she came back from a conference related to this grant. And she said, okay, people, it's really simple. The students might be interested in questions about media or business and so on. And all they need is for someone to show them in an article and in an experience, how these things fit together. So how does theology fit with business? Like they, we just are not equipped. This is nothing like, this is not like really a critique of young people. It's just a critique of how the world sets things up in our heads. So she said, it's really just a matter of saying, read this article on a businesswoman whose faith informs how she does business. And then they're able to see like, oh, I'm kind of seeing that business and theology are related. or can be or ought to be. And then in the afternoon, we take them through experience. So we do seminar work in the morning where they read articles, either scripture or papal documents or, uh, or, or contemporary sources as well, even from lay people, scholarly resources. And then in the afternoon, they do this experiential component where they'll meet with people who are actually doing whatever the track is set up to talk about theology and media, theology and business. And that's where it really embeds it in their head that like, wow, I just met someone who is not only theoretically thinking about how their faith informs their business or how their faith informs the way they approach health and medicine, but but is actually living it out and doing it. So so it's great. That's really the Saints and Scholars experience right there. Uh Yeah. And that prisons in the community through the prison work, that's also uh, a really well, evangelizing thing. The, the Moreau College Initiative is great. It was sort of the, the, it's the it'll be, it was like the brainchild of uh, Jay Caponegro from the University of Notre Dame. Oh, yeah. Dr. Mike Griffin, our provost at Holy Cross College, was part of those early conversations. I think Alicia Serginski was even part of the early conversations, even before she took the job as a director of, of the Moreau College Initiative. There's other great staff members, Justin McDevitt, Justice Cromley. And the, the main idea for the Moreau College Initiative is to say it comes out of the Bard Prison Initiative uh, from the Northeast, which was to say, you know, it's as simple as this. Um, if you give someone a liberal arts education, it frees them. So it frees them in the prison, right? But also equally important or more importantly, I don't know, but well, equally important. It also reduces recidivism drastically, right? And and those of us who appreciate the liberal arts would say like, of course it does, right? Like, of course a liberal arts education reduces recidivism because it frees you. You're no longer trapped the way that you were before by like your own kind of vices or something or as the church would say, structural sin and so on. Yeah. So the Moreau College Initiative is great. It gives a, it gives an associate's degree to some of these men in prison, or or some of them even go on and, and will and earn a BA. Uh, our valedictorian this last uh, graduation commencement was was an alum of the Moreau College Initiative, and okay. his talk was phenomenal. So. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful, yeah. Oh well, this is a very hopeful conversation. It's. Uh, a lot of good things going on with people uh, in different positions within the community, newcomers and leaders and the rank and file, and then the church adding a lot to the conversation and the pursuit. Anything else uh, that you'd like to just mention uh, along those lines? Oh, I think I want to be mindful of the time here, too. Okay. So. And, uh, Paul, uh, um, did we get all the science uh 
I mean, aspect in this. This was this was a conversation that would require you know. Then we'd have to have two or three more. I mean, it's like if you give a mouse a cookie, right? You know, I mean, you know, there'd be two or three more conversations <laughs> follow up on the issues we have here, and then those would open up another two or three <laughs> pieces. Right. And um, that's that's the joy of uh, of having these conversations in the first place. But uh, yeah, I, I think for today we've probably rounded mm. it off, and and I would love to hear if you had some sort of closing remarks or. Um, you know, a place you place you'd like to leave this discussion for today, but yeah, sure. The, actually, something does come to mind in, in, in that kind of frame. The certainly, I am filled with hope. I, I think in my classrooms, um, I, I always tell students because I'm very self conscious about this is to say, like, look, please don't leave a class thinking like, wow, Elberon really hates like science or really hates like uh, media or something or yeah. technology. And, and I'll say like, I, I, I love all of this stuff. So, and maybe there's something about my personality that, that like likes to tear things down or something. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but I always tell the students, like I am all, I end every class looking for signs of hope. And, and I will tell them that like, so for our purpose, for this conversation, just so it's clear that I am, I'm convinced because I see it every semester that once people start to calmly engage truth and by calmly, I mean like, there's no like bombastic rhetoric or whatever going on. And, and there's no fear underlying when they have it as little as possible. Right. Right. Once they're able to see the arguments in a very peaceful way, even startling arguments that challenge their own kind of like paradigms and so on. Mm-hmm. Once they're able to see that and have a discussion and an argument, right. Even a little bit of a fighting back and forth, like a friendly kind of jousting, Mm-hmm. They do begin to see like the truth and the way forward. They do begin to see that God is necessary. They begin to see that the church is necessary. They begin to see the work that the church has done historically right throughout time. Yeah. And they begin to have like a little bit of a sense of like, ah, maybe there is something like to this whole thing about religion in the world. And then of course, what, what, what I don't always get to see the fruits of is how does that, how does that take shape? in their lives down the road, like, does it free them towards the transcendent, right? Does it make, as Basil Moreau would say, like, your job is to get to heaven and take as many people with you as possible, right? Um, Some of them will report back to me. They'll email me years down the road and they'll say, I saw this walking down the streets of Las Vegas and it made me think of that class that that I had with you or something. And and it does take a vision of how they think about their families and and marriage and and, and the world beyond this world, right? The, The supernatural. That's great. So education does seem to free them. I guess that the summary point is the liberal arts education at Holy Cross College really does free people on our campus, on the Moreau College Initiative campus, uh, it frees people and orients them towards towards heaven. But without ever without ever punting on on our concern for this natural world, without ever jettisoning the concern for this natural world and justice questions, right? That's where I would want to leave all of that. There's signs of hope. Yep. In Catholicism, everything is connected to everything else. Right. Yeah. Gee, thank you very much, Dr. Louis Alberon. Hey, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, really good to talk with you. Yes. All the best in your work. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Ave Crux Spezunica. Ah, yes, yes indeed. <laughs> Ave Crux Spezunica. Yes. Thanks for listening to this episode of That's So Second Millennium. TSSM's audio producer is Morgan Burkhart. Our theme music, Igneous Grok, was composed and performed by Vin Marquardt. For my co-host Bill Schmidt, I'm Paul Giesting. Until next time.